Once upon a time, I was a little boy. About this high, I may have been about nine or ten years old, and I was in the school in maybe fourth or fifth grade. I remember the teacher we had very well, Mr. Schoenemann, the name. He taught us many things, at least I believe he did, although specifically I cannot remember anything much. However, one day he was off sick, and a replacement teacher came in. I cannot remember the replacement teacher's name, but the experience I had with this man on that day is still clearly in my memory as if it has had happened yesterday. When it came to the uh, art period, he asked us, what did, you, what did you do so far when it came to art? And we explained to him, well, Mr. Schienemann would uh, draw perhaps a flower or some object on the blackboard and we would uh, copy it. Hmm. He frowned, seemed to be amazed, paced the floor for a few seconds, and thought, listen, someone get me a, a cardboard box. Something like this appeared from somewhere. And as I was sitting in the front row, he said, what's your name? Schmedding. All right, Schmedding, would you draw what you see on the blackboard? Oh, that is wonderful, yes. I'll do something like this on the blackboard, expecting high praise. But high praise never came. He said, just, just come here. And look at it from here. What about that? <laughs> yes, of course. There was the side to it. So I completed my masterpiece by doing this. Again, expecting high praise. However, Mr. whatever his name was, he dropped a bombshell and said, that's wrong. Now, I don't know if you have ever been in a position where you know you're right, and there's a great big teacher over you. You're nine years old, you see down here, and the teacher says you are wrong, where you know that he is wrong and you are right. <coughs> In any case, he said, now look at this more clearly. And he took a ruler, one of those long things, and said, put it here, along the side, and compare it to the edge of the table. Now take your hand, just measure. Some people call it a peak experience. Some people say, well, all of a sudden, my horizon has widened. And I quickly change this to that. After this, we had a, a discussion in class. And consequently, for the rest of the period, everyone drew all sorts of things, windows, door frames, everything you could find, in perspective. Today's seminar is supposed to add through the three R's, three P's. And the first one is to present principles in the, in the primary years. The reason is uh, in language, the ABC is the, the principle. The ABC, if we don't know the ABC, we can't go very far. In science, the ABC are the fundamental principles. And we're talking about, really, everything we have here, the fundamental principles. Once we have things digested and really accommodated in our minds, <clears throat> then later on we can get more and more knowledge based on those foundations. Something which I'm always wondering about is we live in a highly technological age and when it comes to our kids when they enter high school or so <coughs> technologically they are virtually illiterate. So there's obviously a, a gap. Now some futurists paint a dim picture of the role of education in the future world. For instance, uh, this is a quote from uh, a, um, an organization called Discovery, they um, conduct um, mm -hmm. uh, courses for teenagers and self-esteem, etc. It says here, 50% of what we teach today will be obsolete in a few years. 90% of knowledge and information required in the year 2000 has yet to be invented. 50% of existing machinery will be obsolete in five years. 
80% of the children year two will enter careers that do not exist now, involving technology that has not yet been invented. A frightening picture, really. so what are we going to teach? But there's another view, and that's the following. If we consider, I mean, Newton's laws have never been superseded. Einstein's law, Kirchhoff's law, Ohm's law, all those things, they are facts. And I believe if we're concentrating on those principles, we can still take our children way ahead in the future. So we have uh, what we are going to present in two parts. The first is rather theoretical, it is uh, how children's minds function when it comes to technology. And the second is, I've got, as you can see, about uh, 18 or 20 practical experiences here, which I may not be able to get through, but they give you some idea of how we teach science to children in such a way that the experience becomes unforgettable. The study of neurolinguistics teaches us many things about human behavior. One of them, one of those factors which is pertinent here is how we perceive the world through our senses in so many different ways. It appears that from our earliest days we have, we are putting filter in front of our minds which add up to possibly hundreds and by the time we have, we are uh, in, in, in the adult thinking stage, we have well-established opinions. The only thing is that they vary from everyone else's by a considerable degree. If you imagine a circle, an imaginary circle of, say, 360 degrees of total, where everything is known about the world, about life, about the universe, we may see perhaps 2 or 3 percent. But the trouble is no one else will exactly see the same percent same angle. And someone might say, oh, well, this is it, I can see it, this is the world, the whole world, and nothing but the world. And someone else says, no, 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 this is the world. And so it goes on. But the point of all this is, and this is why I'm rubbing this in, when it comes to the perception of the world of the child and the adult, the gap considerably widens. And I would like to use as a stepping stone to all this here, uh, one of the cognitive development models. <coughs> the most famous one is obviously uh, John Piaget, who, before he died, and I believe in 63, he experimented with children for I don't know how many years, all ages, and found out how they, how they function. And in a very abbreviated form, we have this uh, model stages in cognitive development. The first one starts at age zero, for, from age zero to, it used to be four, then it's reduced to, I believe it's now two and a half, where everything goes into the mouth. If you imagine little Emma finds, uh, opens the cupboard in the kitchen and finds a pot lid, and there's a slate floor, it makes a beautiful noise. You see, mommy's on the telephone and it's called, will you shut up? He looks at him, and funny noise, and continues to bang. It's complete egocentricity. This is the first stage, the so-called sensory motor stage. 